Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor being here. So my talk will be about the evolutionary history of modern humans after we left Africa. So one of the most debated topics in human evolution concerns how did we develop our biological and cultural diversity? And when did we as a species start impacting the environment large scale? So some of the most debated questions over more than 100 years relates to are the deep, oh sorry, are the deep or, or shallow roots to present day human biological diversity? In other words, the differences we see between humans today, did they originate deep in time or did they happen more recently? Is the geographical structure of contemporary human populations ancient or recent? For example, we know today we have Asians in Asia, Europeans in Europe, but how far back in time can we actually trace that? Is cultural change driven by population movements and a mixture? or is it by diffusion of ideas? So in other words, the culture change happen when new people are meeting each other and admixing, or does it happen when groups of people just disperse ideas between them without migration and admixture? Are patterns of biological and cultural diversity linked? So in other words, is culture a good proxy for, for population histories? This is a very common assumption in archeology. span Similarly, do similarities in physical traits reflect recently shared ancestry? So for example, if people have shared cranial morphology, does that mean that they're closely related? This is also a quite common assumption in physical anthropology. And were humans or climate the main driver of the mass extinction of large-bodied mammals, megafauna, at the end of the last ice age? If it was indeed humans, then it would be one of the earliest examples of humans having a large impact on the large scale impact on the environment. So modern, DNA from modern humans has been very important for addressing some of these questions. But there are some severe limitations to modern genetics. One is that most populations today are heavily admixed. And it's very difficult to reconstruct the deeper evolutionary history from such admixed individuals. Secondly, from modern genetics, it's impossible to geographically place an evolutionary event. You can't say, did it happen in Asia and Europe, for example. And thirdly, of course, from modern genetics alone, it's impossible to directly link ancient humans to modern humans, or for that matter, ancient humans to other ancient humans. And this is why the founding paper of Ancient DNA by Alan Wilson's group in 1985 was so important. Because it showed for the first time it's possible to retrieve ancient DNA sequences from past remains. And thereby, by this opening the possibility that we could overcome some of these constraints that are connected to modern genetics. However, soon after, it became clear that also ancient DNA has some severe res uh, restrictions. One is that Swanta also mentioned that in the beginning, you could only obtain mitochondrial DNA because it's, it survives better in the fossil record. However, mitochondrial DNA has been shown not to be a very good marker for reconstruction of complex population histories. There you really want nuclear DNA. And secondly, and more fundamentally, is the problem of contamination with modern human DNA. <clears throat> And this problem was so severe that until 2010, it was the common belief was it's impossible to obtain reliable ancient human DNA sequences from anatomically modern human remains. It's a little bit better with acaric humans because they're more genetically distinct from living humans. But of course, this put a major constraint on the usefulness of ancient DNA to reconstruct human evolutionary history if we cannot obtain reliable ancient human DNA sequences. And this is why our founding paper from 2010 is very important because it shows for the first time it's possible not only to obtain reliable ancient human DNA sequences, you can actually obtain a whole genome sequence for an anatomically modern human. And not only that, you can obtain it with an average coverage 
of 20x, meaning that it's almost as good quality as that from a living human being. It also showed that it's possible to quantify, with this amount of data, it's possible to quantify the amount of contamination and take it into account in subsequent analysis. So the DNA of, of this specimen was highly degraded. The average length was 55 base pairs, and the maximum length was 70 base pairs, meaning that it was not possible with traditional PCR-based approaches to obtain the DNA from this specimen. You had, we had to use next-generation sequencing technology, both to obtain the DNA and obtain the genome. And what it showed was that this individual belongs to a now extinct population of modern humans. And it also showed that he's representing a previously unrecognized migration from the old world, from Siberia into the new world, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, that took place after Native American ancestors came into the Americas, but before Inuit ancestors that are occupying the new world Arctic today came in. And the mythology approaches that we developed during this study is really what we have used since to revisit the human history using ancient human genomics and trying to address some of the basic questions that are outlined in the beginning of my talk. So for example, last year we published a genome from one of the earliest anatomically modern humans found in Europe, Koshchenki, dated to be between 36,000 and 38,000 years old. And this genome tells us an, a number of interesting things. First of all, he's lying on the European branch, on the European lineage. This means that, that the time when the East Asian and European lineages diversified, split, must predate 36,000 years. And this is important because based on modern genetics, you get very large error marking on this estimate, some of them going all the way up to 17,000 years. But obviously, these results show that this divergence is much deeper than that. Also, if we then look at the genome of Koshchenki, then very surprisingly, we could see that almost all the genetic components that today are found in contemporary Europeans are present in Koshchenki, meaning they are present in Europe already 36,000 years ago. And that even include the genetic component that normally is associated with the arrival of farmers from the Middle East into Europe 8,000 years ago. That's actually even present 36,000 years ago in Europe. So what it suggests is that this is an example of genetic diversity in contemporary modern humans that, can, that basically were established deep in the evolutionary past. This is also the same thing we, we could see when we sequenced the first aborigine Australian genome. This time it was from an historical ancient sample in order to avoid recent admixture. And the origin of aborigine Australians have been heavily debated. I mean, some people have even argued that they kind of evolved separately from other modern humans, from, uh, from Homo erectus. Others have argued they are a branch of East Asians, meaning they derived very late. But what we can see is that aborigine, the aborigine Australian genetic line is in fact going very far back in time. And it's probably separating, diversifying at least 20,000 years before the East Asian and European branches are diversifying from each other. And then aborigine Australians reach Australia probably about 50,000 years ago and seems to be living pretty much in a high degree of isolation until recently. We do find evidence of gene flow between the ancestors of aborigine Australian and the ancestors of East Asians. But this is a secondary event. And this is the reason why aborigine Australians are closer, genetic, look closer to, to uh, East Asians than, for example, to Europeans. So this is another example of present-day human diversity that was formed deep in the past. And it's both of them are probably also examples, very likely examples of genetic lineages that you find in certain geographical regions today and where they probably have been remaining for very far back in time. The question is, is that always the case? Well, 
we sequenced the genome of a 24,000-year-old skeleton, Maltar, from Lake Baikal, here up in central Siberia. And this is an area today occupied by, Mon by Mongolians, people of East Asian ancestry. However, Maltar has not very much to do with East Asians. In fact, he's more closely related to contemporary Western Eurasians, particularly Northern Europeans, and then to Native Americans. So this is an example where you can say the genetic lineages that are present in an area today is quite different from those that were present in the deeper past. It also shows us the population that we thought not had much to do with each other, namely Northern Europeans and Native Americans, actually have have shared genes in, in, in recent history. In fact, Native Americans is traditionally believed to be a group of East Asians crossing the Bering Strait getting into the Americas. However, we can see that one-third of the genome, one-third is a lot, is actually coming from this Maltar population that also are providing genes to Northern Europeans. So these were examples of genetic diversity that was formed in the deeper past. What about is there also genetic diversity being formed in more recent history? So in order to address this question, as well as the question of how do cultural change happening, is it through movement and a mixing of people, or is it through the spread of ideas between population without involving uh, admixture and population movements? We decided to undertake the, sorry, undertake uh, the largest ancient genome study to date, where we sequenced more than 100 ancient genomes from, uh, from Europe and Asia. And thereby, we actually more than doubled the amount of ancient human genomes available to date. And these genomes are covering the period from the Neolithic, Neolithics across the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. And the Bronze Age is a period of major culture changes, both in Europe and Asia. And what we can see is, in fact, these cultural changes is associated with the movement and the mixing of people. So in the beginning of the Bronze Age, about 5,000 years ago, we see a movement of people called the Amnaya into northern and central Europe. And here they are mixing with the local farmers and a lot of the genetic differences between Northern Europeans and Southern Europeans today are actually formed in this event. But not only that, they're also moving eastwards across the Ural Mountains into central Siberia, where they are replacing the local hunter-gatherers hunter represented by this Maltai individual from Lake Baikal. And this early spread here are not only bringing a lot of cultural changes with it, it also fits very beautifully with the early spread of the Indo-European languages. But only 1,000 years later, we actually see another movement from Central Europe across the Ural Mountains into Western and Central Asia, called the Sintasta. And the Sintasta is then replacing the Yamnaya people in Central Asia. And then in the end of the Bronze Age, then we start seeing East Asian people getting into Central Asia. And in the beginning, they're living together with the Europeans in kind of a multi-ethnical cultures. But over time, the East Asians become more and more dominant and kind of outbreed the, the Europeans. And in the end, we're ending up with kind of the scenario we know today with a very East Asian dominated uh, genetically uh, in, in Central Asia. So you can say this is an example of, of, you can say, that, that the geographical structure of uh, present-day humans are formed extremely late, just within the last 2,000 years. We can also see that this period, the Bronze Age, that's actually the period where, where a majority of the finer genetic uh, structure in Europe, in Asia, is formed. So if we look at the late hunter galleries in Europe, then they share genetic components with present-day Europeans, but they're falling outside the genetic diversity of present-day Europeans. The same is the case with the Neolithic farmers. But when we get to the Bronze Age, that's basically where we start seeing 
the genetic diversity pattern that we know from Europe and Asia today. So what is the driver of this massive population dynamics? Quite surprisingly, we discovered in a number of these skeletons, both from Europe and Asia, evidence of plague of pestis. So this is by far the oldest evidence of pestis or plague that we, we know today that has been directly found. And what is interesting is that they are also basal to all the strains of pestis that we currently know, but still they contain all the pathogenic elements, all those elements that makes it pathogenic to humans. So this suggests that diseases might be a major driver in this population dynamics. And diseases have probably been an important driver even before the establishments of real cities and dense populations. We can also see that some genetic traits that are very abundant today in certain populations seems to be introduced during this period. So for example, the ability to break down milk sugar, to drink raw milk if you want as an adult, that has a genetic base. And globally, it's very rare. But in Northern Europe particularly, it's very common. Between 70 and 80% of adult human beings in Northern Europe can basically drink raw milk without becoming sick. And most people thought, well, this ability was something that was introduced with the farmers from the Middle East coming in 8,000 years ago to Europe. And then very quickly it was selected for. But what we can see, oh sorry, is that basically even during the Bronze Age, it's extremely rare in the European population. Actually, the population that seems to have some of the highest frequencies of this is the Yamnaya people from Northern Caucasus. So therefore, of course, it's very tempting to speculate, well, it's actually the Yamnaya people bringing in this ability, genetic ability, this genetic trait into Europeans. And then only within the last 2,000 years, very recently, it's actually becoming very dominant, very high frequent. So it's something that happens very late in history. So the Bronze Age was an example of cultural changes happening as a result of migration and admixture. And this actually seems to be a quite common process because we also, I haven't time to show you that, but we also find evidence of that during the Neolithization in Southern Europe, that, that, that these farmers are getting in, mixing with people and bringing farming with them. However, can cultural changes also happen through the spread of ideas only, without migrations and admixing? And yes, that seems to be the case. For example, if we go to the New World Arctic, there we found evidence of an early migration of people about 5,000 years into Alaska and then into Canada and Greenland, and they're settling in Canada here and Greenland. And here they're living for almost 5,000 years until the Inuit ancestors, those that are occupying the New World Arctic today, are coming in from Siberia and basically replacing these Paleo-Eskimos. And um, the replacement takes place, are, have, are, are completed just within the last 700 years. So it's just 700 years ago that this population of Paleo-Eskimos goes extinct. But what is interesting is that during this time, they seem to be living in complete genetic isolation. So we don't find any evidence of gene flow with Native Americans or with other Siberian people after they have settled here in this part of the Arctic. Still, during this time, they undergo massive, massive cultural changes, basically starting out as 100% terrestrial hunters of muskox and reindeer and ending up as being almost 100% marine hunters. So this, I would say, is an example of cultural changes that can happen, not involving migration or mixture, but rather the spread of ideas within a population. So with the Bronze Age, we saw that, that culture can actually be a pretty good proxy for population histories. But is this always the case? This is a very common assumption in archaeology. 
And to test this further, we decided to go into the, look into the debate of early peopling of the Americas. So for years, people have been discussing who was the first peoples getting into the Americas. Was it Native American ancestors coming from Siberia into the Americas? Or alternatively, was it Europeans, peoples from France and Spain, crossing the Atlantic, getting into the Americas, developing the so-called Clovis technology with huge spare points, and then later being replaced by Native Americans coming in from Siberia. So the key argument for this solution hypothesis, as it's called, is similarities in tools between Clovis and solution technology in Europe. And Clovis tools has been found all over North America, but there's only one single site where there has been found a skeleton associated with these Clovis tools, dated to be 12,600 years old. And we sequenced the genome of this Clovis individual, and what we can see is this individual is 100% Native American. It actually contains one third of its genome from the Maltar population, exactly like other Native Americans. And not only that, the population from which this individual derives, comes from, are directly ancestral to the majority of all Native Americans today. So in other words, this is an example where similarities in tools is a result of parallel evolution, right? Convergent evolution. It's not reflecting recent shared history. And it shows that you have to sometimes to definitely be very careful if you assume that culture is just directly linked to people, population histories. Similarly, another way that is often used also to look at recently shared ancestry is cranial morphology. So some people assume that if you have the same cranial morphology, then you actually have, you are closely related. You have a recently shared history. But is that actually the case? Well, in order to address this, we decided to look into a very famous case, namely that of the Kennewick man. This is another skeleton, ancient skeleton from North America dated to 8,500 years. And based on cranial morphology, researchers have claimed that this individual is closely related to Ainu of Japan or Polynesians, and more closely so than to Native Americans, thereby also Im implying that there was another early migration of people separate from that of Native Americans into the Americas. And then we actually, then we did uh, the genome of Kennedy Man very recently, and we could again see this individual is 100% Native American. And in fact, there's no more Ainu in this individual or Polynesian than those in living Native Americans today. So this is another example where you can say that the assumption that just cranial morphology are actually reflecting recently shared history doesn't seem to hold. And the problem is pro it's probably the issue of you only having one individual rather than a population of Kennewick men. If you had a population of Kennewick men and could look at the variation in cranial morphology, you might have been able to place them, you can say, in regard to contemporary populations. But of course, when you go to the deeper past, it's very rare that you find a whole population of, of skeletons. And in fact, quite of ironically, one of the tribes that originally had claimed Kennewick man as their ancestor and wanted him, back, wanted him repatriated, but wasn't allowed to get him, was one of the closest living relatives to Kennewick man. Okay, lastly, I would like to touch upon when did humans actually start impacting the environment large scale? So one of the candidates for that is what we call the late quaternary megafauna extinctions. And uh, this is the extinction of big-bodied mammals like mammoth, woolly rhino, mastodon, etc., that is happening in the end of the last ice age around 14 to 10,000 years ago. And we're really talking about a mass extinction. About two-thirds of the animals are disappearing. And some people, some scientists have claimed, well, this is due to human hunting, while others have argued this is due to climatic changes. 
And there's no doubt that humans were hunting these animals. I mean, we find evidence of that several places. Here we have a mastodon from North America, and embedded in the upper rib is a projector point. The question is, did they hunt them to a degree that caused extinction? And in order to address this, we undertook what I think believe still is the largest scale ancient DNA study on these uh, megafauna remains. So basically, we collected bone samples across Europe, Asia, North America from a variety of megafauna animals. C14 dated the bones, obtained DNA from it to reconstruct the population histories. And then what we also did was something called niche modeling, where we basically predict what would the space, the niche space, have been of each of these species through time if it was, if it was only determined by climate, precipitation, and temperatures. And then lastly, we revisited the archaeological record, finding out how many, of, how many individuals did humans consume of these different animals through different times, and when and did they actually overlap in time and space with these animals. And what becomes very clear from this data is that climate changes is a major driver of these population dynamics. So you see a direct correlation between climate niche space and effective population size of these animals. There is a few cases where humans actually might have contributed severely to the extinction. And this is uh, bison and horse in Europe and the Asia. There, humans might actually have had some kind of effect, but there's no doubt that climate is the major driver of this. And this is also what we see when we sequenced, as Svante mentioned, the oldest genome to date, that of a 700,000-year-old horse, as well as the genomes of other ancient horses, and reconstruct changes in population size. We basically see that they are following the climate very nicely. So when it's cold, it's good to be a horse. When it's warm, it's bad to be a horse, so to speak. So what is it then about climate that are causing these dynamics and potential extinctions? To address this, we, looked, we took advantage of a discovery that me and Anders Hansen did during our, our PhDs, namely that you, that you can actually obtain diverse plant and animal DNA directly from ancient sediments, even in the absence of macrophosites. And this is because feces and urine and fine rootlets are getting, sh are getting shed to the sediments, and there they are getting degraded, but the DNA will bind to sediment particles and therefore survive. And that means you can actually retract the DNA directly from the sediments and reconstruct the vegetation and animal life. And we did this large scale. We collected more than 200 sediment samples across Europe, Asia, and North America. Here. And then we obtained plant DNA from it to reconstruct the, the vegetation history. We also obtained, we also got access, you know, to mummified bodies of these megafauna animals, such as woolly rhino and mammoth, etc., And then we could obtain feces sample from the, from the gut and look at what was these animals actually eating. And what we can see is that the vegetation has changed very dramatically over the last 50,000 years. So originally, it was very diverse and dominated by protein-rich forbs. But at the end of the last ice age, what we see is a complete change in vegetation into the vegetation type we know today with a lot of shrubs and grasses, and a, a heavy decline of these protein-rich forbs. And then when we look at the gut content of these animals, we can see that the dominant food source for them is the protein forbs. So in other words, I mean, it's tempting to say, well, it's climate that are changing the vegetation, and the vegetation change is actually what caused, you can say, the decline, and most likely in many cases, the extinction of these animals. So just to conclude, is the deep or shallow roots to present-day human biological diversity, both basically. So that there's no doubt that there was major genetic components that was established already between 36 and 62,000 years ago in Eurasia. Obviously, in Africa, it's probably much older than that. However, finer grain genetic diversity seen in, present, in, in populations outside Africa is established surprisingly late. I don't think there would be many who had predicted that a minority, a large part of the genetic variation was actually, was actually come about you know, within the last 5,000 years.
What about current geographical population structure? Is it ancient versus recent? Both. But in some areas, it's surprisingly recent, as we saw, just within the last 2,000 years. That's where basically people are settling where we know they are today. Cultural diversity resulting uh, is cultural changes resulting from migrations and mixture version, diffu versus diffusion of ideas. Well, it seems so far that migration and a mixture is a very dominant type for co driving cultural changes. But there's no doubt that cultural changes also can happen just through the diffusion of ideas. Is biological and cultural diversity linked? Well, in some cases, yes, as we saw in the Bronze Age, but in others, as we saw with the solution and Clovis technology, they're not. And they are actually a result of parallel evolution. Physical traits, is that reflecting recent ancestry, such as cranial morphology? Probably in some cases, yes, but not always. And particularly using a single individual from the past seems to be very dangerous. Human versus climate as driver of ice age megafauna and extinctions, well, humans played some kind of role, but definitely climate and vegetational changes seems to be the main driver of the extinction. Finally, I would just like to say that one of the things I really enjoy about this work is actually engaging with some of the indigenous peoples from where we obtain these samples. These are like Northern Native Americans and uh, Aboriginal Australians, and these are people who are very traditionally very skeptical and very resistant towards science because they have been very poorly treated by scientists in the past. But what is amazing to see is that when we have done some of this work, they have been so excited that a number of these groups have actually changed their mind and now want to do more research to understand you know, the past history through DNA. And this is just wonderful. And I want to give a special thanks to these communities because without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.